Hello guys, thanks for joining. My name is Alessandro Pilotti. Uh, we're going to talk about migrating workloads from VMware to OpenStack. Okay, so it's actually um, we are explaining a few concepts about um, uh, migrations and the best strategies, let's say, to move con content around between different clouds. And we will introduce a project called Coriolis that we've been working on, and it's actually aimed exactly at that. Okay. Um, how many of you guys are running VMware? Good. How many of you are running OpenStack? Okay. This is obviously a rhetorical question, but <laughs> I had to ask it. So, um, okay. So let's set the context first. Um, in, in our domain, we are constantly moving workloads from one, let's say, technological generation to the other. No? So um, a few years ago, we were moving from physical server to virtual machines, right? And that was like during the, during the 2000s, basically. Then the next obvious step was to move from uh, virtual machines to something that was, able, uh, that was allowing us to define in a software-defined way, let's say, the, our resources. No? So we moved from virtual machines to infrastructure as a service, which is where we are today. No? From there, we moved to container. And if you, if you look around about the marketing that lots of companies are doing today, including, for example, Microsoft, there is, of course, also a new option, which is the so-called serverless no? model, in which you just develop applications without thinking about servers and so on. The, the part in which we are interested in particular at the moment, and where most of the companies out there are, is the virtual machines to infrastructure as a service. No? So we move to a traditional virtualization, like VMware System Center and so on, to software-defined everything, no? where, of course, OpenStack is the undisputed king. Or it could be, of course, a public cloud, like, again, Azure or AWS or Google Cloud or um, Oracle and so on. In the moment in which you move from one generation to the other, there is always a cost associated, okay? But if you do the things right, you're also improving the TCO. Of course, there is no particular reason to move from one generation to the other if, the, if you don't improve your, your investments, right? Your total cost of ownership. So um, let's talk about why do we do it, no? As I was mentioning before, in general, what we're trying to achieve is to improve our total cost of ownership. Um, we might want to do it because we have a new on-premise cloud infrastructure. So we have some old servers, we have a bunch of new servers, then we might want to move our workload from one to the other. No? Um, we have um, a public cloud, so we might just want to move our stuff from, from on-premise to public cloud. So that's actually happening pretty often, right? Or we might want to move public cloud to on-prem. There are also a ton of reasons to do that. No? Or we might want to do a redeployment on-prem. For example, you might have um, an old OpenStack cloud, old quote-unquote, of course, like for example, OpenStack Kilo, and you might want to move to Newton. So there are, of course, always uh, easy ways to move, um, easy, quote-unquote, again, um, to move from uh, one version of OpenStack to the next one, let's say Newton to Okata, for example. But if you start to uh, have a gap between the uh, OpenStack version, it becomes more and more complicated, okay? So lots of our customers, I would say even the majority, deploy OpenStack and they simply remain stuck to that version until one day they decide, well, it's too old, I need to move to a new version because I need the new features or whatever else. So, and they come to us and they say, well, can you help us to move from, uh, from ice cells, from Kilo and whatever, to, uh, to Newton, to Okata, and whatever the next one in the block is, okay? So there is really no direct way to, to do an in-place migration, so one of the easy options is to just to have two, uh, two parallel deployments, one with the old one, one in the new one, and simply move the stuff from one to the other, okay? Um, Let's talk about a little bit which are the options, okay? I took this diagram from uh, uh, Stephen Orban from, um, from, uh, from Amazon to give credit because I think it's very, very well done. So there are, in the moment in which you decide to move your workloads from uh, one cloud to another, uh, 
there is not just one option. There are actually a lot of them. Uh, the first one I'm talking about is just called uh, Rearchitect. So, you know, <laughs> usually in the OpenStack context, uh, when people ask, um, hey, how can I move my, my application to the cloud, you know? And the typical answer is rewrite it. <laughs> yes, which is a very simple answer, very clear, because people say, well, you know, if you move to the cloud, you cannot rely on your, um, uh, you cannot rely an, anymore on, on the host for high reliability now, because lots of people using VMware or System Center, Hyper-V, and everything are typically relying on, for example, vMotion and similar technologies for, uh, for the high availability of their workloads. Now, if one of the hosts goes down, your workload keeps on running somewhere else, okay? It doesn't mean that this is not available in, in OpenStack, for example, the Hyper-V driver does it, okay? But um, I have to say as, as a disclaimer that we write the Hyper-V driver, so. <laughs> but anyway, um, um, but generally speaking, the public clouds and in general the cloud design is such in which you don't rely on the underlying host. You have the entire high availability concentrated in the application layer, so in what actually you write, no? So for example, if you might have a, a web application, you might have a lot of different instances that are simply load balanced. If one of them dies, the other one will just carry on with the work, no? So if the underlying KVM node, which is currently hosting one of those, will die, no problem. The others will be hosted somewhere else and work, no? So as, soon as, you have, as, as long as you have your affinity rules properly set, everything will just work. So um, beautiful. Rewriting your application is definitely the best thing to do. But if you spend the previous 20 years writing your line of business applications, probably it won't happen overnight. It may take you another, maybe not 20 years, but five years. No? So there is a, in our experience, at least at our customers, there are a ton of applications that people don't even know how they're written. People left and knew how to come, you know, and, you know, nowadays we have all this very nice continuous integration and um, testing suits. We have all this, you know, um, agile methodologies and everything, okay? But five years ago, not so many people necessarily had them. So you end up with a lot of spaghetti code, which is difficult to maintain, difficult to port, and definitely difficult to rewrite because you have first to understand how that logic worked before moving on, no? So what most probably you will do is to write your new applications with uh, microservices, pass layers, and whatever else, no? The old ones, not so much. Um, so I don't say that rewriting is not a good idea, actually it's the best idea you can have, but it's not definitely the most feasible one in most cases. It's expensive, it's time consuming, and ah, don't forget also one thing, if you rewrite your application, it's not only impacting on the developers, it's impacting also on the users. So I don't know you guys, but uh, in, in our experience, sometimes you just move one button from here to here, and you have users complaining. <laughs> so think about rewriting completely everything and have to retrain, retrain everybody to do that. So definitely not something which is particularly easy. Um, repurchase. This is the second option. If you have something that you wrote in-house and there's somebody else that wrote an, a SaaS service that does exactly what your software was doing, well, that's another perfect good idea. You don't have to rewrite it, you just buy a different software, possibly as a service, no? Uh, Salesforce, whatever else, you know, perfect ideas. Unfortunately, this works only in the cases in which, uh, uh, well, you have a pretty generic type of application because nobody's going to do a SaaS service only for your specific needs. Otherwise, why should they do it, no? But as long as it's something very common, like, I don't know, a billing application, uh, I don't know, accounting application, um, something that, you know, can, an ERP, all those things definitely have uh, lots of, um, in, let's say, SaaS options that it's very well, well worth doing it. The problem there is, if I move to the con side, is that, of course, there, whenever you need a customization, it's very difficult to fit it, or very expensive, you know, because you have to ask, of course, the makers of those applications to do it for you. Migrating data can be expensive and time consuming because you have gazillions of gigabytes of data that have to be moved to a completely different platform. Um, and of course, again, there is a learning curve for your users. 
The next option is one of the obvious ones. You cannot imagine how many times it happens that you go to a, uh, to, to, to a customer and you find racks and racks full of servers with stuff which runs since ages and nobody has an idea what's inside there. And everybody is simply too scared to decommission it because they simply lost track about what's happening there, okay? So the best thing that you could do is probably to do an auditing, discovering what actually you need and what not, and, and, and take a decision and simply shut down what's not needed, okay? Biggest advantage, you stop paying for keeping that stuff running. Now, because whether if it's on-premise or not, there is always a cost, electricity, uh, maintenance, and everything else, no? And if you move into a public cloud, well, that would be a significant cost that you are simply sparing. Another obvious one is retain. <laughs> Not everything is meant to be migrated. There are things that are worked to stay where they are, okay? For example, if you have uh, applications which are not self-contained, but they have a tight integration with the underlying cloud or, or virtual infrastructure. So if your application is talking directly to the VM or APIs, well, you cannot just take that application and move it to OpenStack. You have also to rewrite that entire piece of code which is talking to VMware, okay? So that thing, definitely, you, you have to retain it or toss it away and rewrite it. The next one is particularly interesting, which is the so-called uh, replatforming. Replatforming is a kind of in-between thing uh, between the uh, re-architecture that we were talking before uh, and the re-hosting, which is the next topic, okay? So replatforming means that you take the applications as they are, but instead of... Uh, running them in the current platform, you're simply wrapping them in a different context, okay? This wrapping, quote-unquote, uh, can be um, clean when the application allow it or very, very dirty when they don't, okay? So think about it. An example could be you take an, an ASP.NET web application, which is self-contained inside of its, I don't know, IAS web server or, I don't know, a PHP application which is nicely contained as a Apache website, you take it, you containerize it, and you move it, okay? So that's a pretty simple case of uh, replatforming. Or you wrap it into, into um, a pass layer uh, alternative. It could be Cloud Foundry, OpenShift, Azure Service Fabric, whatever else, okay? Those are all examples of replatforming. Take what you have, try to understand, you know, how it works, divide it in services somehow, and put it inside of a different platform. It's not so easy, usually, because you have a, a web front end, some middleware layers, uh, some databases, all those things that to be mode and orchestrated in a way in which they can talk to each other, okay? Um, we are big fans of Kubernetes for this, for this type of application, because you containerize and then you have a, a Kubernetes handling or the orchestration for you, right? But again, it takes work and you need to do it. And it doesn't necessarily apply in all the cases. So you might have actually to do a lot of hacking involved just to, you know, make it work. Okay, let's talk about the next one now, which is um, uh, which, the one which will lead to the rest of the conversation today, no? which is the re-hosting. Re -hosting. Whenever you talk to a cloud purist about re-hosting, they typically make an expression like, Ugh, you know, because it's something that uh, uh, it's against all the common sense in public clouds. Now, because you take what you have the way in which it is today and you move it to a new cloud exactly the way it is, including all the defects that it has, okay? But what's the, uh, what's the point there? You have a, a, a big advantage. And the advantage is that you don't have to care what's inside of your virtual machines. You take them, you lift them, you shift them, and you make them run in the new in your context, okay? So people might tell you, well, if you do that, you don't take any advantage of the cloud. That's not true. You take a lot of advantage just by the fact that you spare a lot of money from paying, I don't know, for a cloud infrastructure that you don't need anymore. Because the problem is that you, 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 you will end up anyway with two clouds. The old VMware, for example, I mean, I'm not pointing fingers at VMware and everything, okay? It's just like an example or system center or whatever else, and the new one, for example, OpenStack, no? While if you do the full uh, um, um, re-hosting thing, you can move everything, get rid of the old cloud, spare a ton of money, okay? Maybe reusing the servers for, for, an open, for, for OpenStack compute nodes or whatever else, 
And with the money that you spared improving your TCO, you can invest them in redeveloping your new applications. No? So you can, the, the re-hosting, the advantage of re-hosting is that it can be done in an almost completely blind way, meaning you take the servers, you move them, and in the meantime, you think about what to do next, okay? What to rewrite and everything. So that, that's actually the way that we, we typically operate. Um, well, as I was mentioning, so you won't take full advantage of the cloud model for day one. Um, and of course, the target cloud solution might not have the host level of high availability that you're looking for. So you, you have to think about that. You know? What we were discussing before, that when you have, a, um, for example, a, a, a database that might actually rely on the host, underlying host, you know, for high availability, you might not have that on the target cloud, okay? So you have to be careful on that. Uh, Rehosting is something that you can do manually. You can take your virtual machines, move them over, so extract them somehow of the source cloud, think about getting the VMDKs from, from VMware, convert them to QCOW2, import them somehow in Glance, talking about OpenStack, okay, and then doing a ton of manual steps to get it work on the new environment. Some examples of those steps are um, well, the virtual disk format, we already talked about that. Um, the synthetic kernel drivers, you know, because when you switch from one hypervisor to another, there are a lot of differences. It's two different types of virtual hardware. So on VMware, you have the VMware tools, and on the other side, you have um, virtual drivers, or LIS, or whatever else, no? Um, in ETRD, in ETRD are typically containing whatever drivers you need to boot your system, and since you don't plan to have all the possible drivers in there, you definitely might not have the ones for the target. So you have to run Dracut or whatever else in order to regenerate those in ETRD images, no? SE Linux, by definition, won't play very well if suddenly discovers that you have a different disk under, under your, your feet, you know, so it won't prevent you from booting from that, no? So you have to tell SE Linux to allow that. PCI IDs will change radically. You have a different machine. It's not different if you ever try to take a hard disk from a laptop and put it in another laptop and boot it. It's the same identical thing. You will find, so the operating system will hopefully boot, but you might find a ton of uh, differences due to the fact that you have, for example, different network configurations. What used to be called ATH0 is no more ATH0. It's going to be ATH1 because it will find a new adapter. Unless you go on uh, UDEV uh, and you go on the net rules and you assign that specific name to a specific MAC address or whatever else, and so that the system only boots, it will know that that specific PCI ID it has that name, okay? Provisioning agents. If I'm moving from VMware to OpenStack, I will need to add cloud in it if I want to full take advantage of my cloud um, and, Metadata API, right? If I'm going to, to Azure, I will need a VA Linux agent. If I have Windows and I move it from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, VMware to, to, cloud, to, to, to OpenStack, I will need to add cloud based in it and blah, 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 blah. Um, all these things. So if you Google for like, how do I move a machine from VM from VMware to OpenStack, you will find a lot of blog posts explaining all the steps. Now, if you have to do it, for one or two machines. Do it manually, there is no particular reason to get crazy to, to have full automation. But if you're moving an entire infrastructure, we're talking about hundreds or thousands or more of virtual machines, you don't want to do it manually for a bunch of reasons. First, because it will take you forever, and second, because everything which is manual is error prone, right? And since we are talking about moving to a software-defined everything <laughs> infrastructure, well, why don't we also software-defined the migration, right? And, um, okay. Okay, one last thing about, about migration. Migration are relatively easy when you go uh, same platform to same platform and same uh, hypervisor to same hypervisor. For example, if I'm doing OpenStack plus KVM to OpenStack plus KVM, then I don't have too many steps to do. It's much more complex when I do uh, inter-platform and inter uh, hypervisor uh, uh, migrations, okay, how in that case. Okay, so now that we set the context, uh, 
let's introduce Coriolis, which is the project that we wrote for exactly for, for this um, uh, reason. It's a fully automated lift and shift migrations from and to any cloud virtualization solutions. It's scalable. You can do one migration or a thousand at the same time. It has a REST API and it uses Keystone for identity management. So here is, a, is an idea about how the architecture works, okay? Um, it, it has been written to look and feel exactly like an OpenStack service, okay? The main idea is that uh, you can just uh, register the endpoints in Keystone and you will have a new migration endpoint together with uh, compute endpoints, uh, um, I don't know, okay, Cinder endpoints, uh, I don't know, Swift endpoints or whatever you might have there, okay? Um, as you can see, it has a uh, um, REST API front, so the user will get, will get a token, connect, and then whatever, based on, of course, of whatever access the user might have, it will be able to perform operations, okay? Behind the APIs, there is a conductor, so all those microservices are talking about each other via MQP, so via Rabbit, like any other OpenStack service. There is a scheduler, which is in charge of, well, scheduling the operations. There is a database, typically MySQL or anything which is be able to be digested by SQL Alchemy, which contains, um, well, the configuration of your migrations and so on. And then there are the worker processes, which are particularly important in this context. The workers are the ones which are actually connecting to, the, to your infrastructures, okay? So you might have one worker talking to, to VMware on one side and one worker talking to, uh, to OpenStack on the other. It might be also the same worker, okay? Uh, it's up to you how many workers you want to deploy in your infrastructure. As I mentioned before, this is meant to be scalable. So you might have uh, hundreds of workers if you want, okay? Also, the placement of the workers can be strategically put in order to optimize uh, the traffic between, um, uh, between the workers. So, so that basically, the, if you have to migrate 100 gigabytes from, from one infrastructure to the other, you definitely don't want to send it out to a public cloud and then back to your infrastructure, okay? So that's why I believe that a SaaS model, a model for migration doesn't really work, okay? It might be easy for vendors to set up because this way, you know, it's easy to control, but it's, it's, it's very inefficient from any other perspective, you know? So the best way you can do is that you have full control of your workers. All those things are, as I was saying before, regular um, um, uh, microservices written the OpenStack way, so they are written in Python, using Oslo and uh, Keystone, as I mentioned before, and Barbican um, as part of their components, okay? And, um, and they can run anywhere on Windows or, or, or on Linux. So, for example, we typically package them in, in, in Ubuntu or, or CentOS VM, and they just run, okay? So they're also very easy to distribute. So, for example, if you want to, uh, to put a worker in your VMware infrastructure, you just take a virtual machine with the, <laughs> with the components running on top of it, and you run it. So nothing particularly complicated to install, okay? Or even better, a container. Uh, Barbican, Barbican is the OpenStack um, project which is meant to handle secrets. And what secrets do we have here? We have two credentials to connect to the source of the target cloud, right? So you don't want to have your VMware credentials floating around in clear text in, with the risk that they end up in, uh, in, uh, in uh, log files, no? You want to make sure that, uh, that they will be safe and only the workers will be able to access them when they need it. How do the worker access them? Well, you have a Keystone token, which is traveling through the context across all those various layers. So since you created the secret, you are allowing basically with your token, Coriolis to go and fetch the token for the, the, the secret for you, no? Uh, Coriolis, of course, uses also a Keystone Trust in the process because of course a migration <laughs> might run more than, than the time uh, that, that your token can live, you know? So if your migration lasts more than one hour, you will end up for a for one if you, if you don't have a, a way to handle that. Um, okay, bar, um, Barbican is of course optional, so if you want to pass the credential in clear text, you can do it. Okay, next, um, the workers, um, so Coriolis itself has no idea about VMware, OpenStack, AWS, Azure, or whatever else, okay? What 
Coriolis has is a fully decoupled interface so that you can write your own so-called providers, which are basically Python plugins, which implement a given set of interfaces. And those plugins know how to talk to a given cloud. So whenever we add a new one, we simply implement those plugins so we don't touch the core of, of Coriolis itself. No? Um, so of course there is a plugin a provider for VMware, it is a provider for OpenStack in this case. No? We distinguish them in import and export providers because you, in this case we are exporting from VMware and importing into OpenStack, okay? But of course we could also the other way around. So this way you can, for example, uh, export from AWS and import into OpenStack, export from one OpenStack and import it another, and so on, okay? Uh, what's next? Um, another important component that we will see pretty soon is the concept of OS morphers, how we call them internally, which is what uh, inspects the content of your disks, determines what type of operating system it runs, and performs operations based on what it finds, okay? Uh, meaning that if it discovers that there is a Windows, it will perform a given set of operations, knowing that it goes on OpenStack, for example. If it's an RL, it will do some operation, an Ubuntu, some others, a center some others and, and so on, okay? Also, those type of morphers are fully decoupled, so anytime you can add a new, a new, a new operating system, and of course, those, the, the steps that you have to perform are different based on the, on the operating system you are doing and the target platform that you are performing, okay? Uh, what's next? Supported clouds virtualization solutions, uh, uh, sorry, uh, OpenStack components, we already discussed it. Here is a quick list of what we support today. So we have OpenStack, KVM, uh, and OpenStack with all the possible hypervisors, Azure, AWS, vSphere, of course, um, uh, System Center, Sense Server, um, OVIRT and KVM, Oracle VM, and we plan to add also GCE and Oracle Cloud soon, okay? So basically, whenever somebody comes and asks for one, we, we do it. And of course, it's, it's, it's open also for others to do it. Um, so this type of migrations can be very error prone. Why? Because uh, there can be any possible type of transient issue while you moving this stuff, no? This is not something that takes three seconds and it's done. It's something that might take even half an hour or even more, depending on how many gigabytes of, of data you have to transfer, no? So in that moment, you might have, um, I don't know, um, the connectivity between the, the source and the target will fail because, I don't know, somebody tripped on a cable <laughs> or lights went off or whatever else. So you need to have fully, full resiliency to make sure that things work, okay? And that's one thing. Another thing is that uh, the tasks that you're performing are a lot, and if you do them one after the other, you are wasting a lot of time. So what you want to do most probably is to parallelize as many as you can and put sequentially only the ones that depend on, on each other. No? So Coriolis is basically based on a, on a, a, on a task flow meaning that we, every, every, every migration is divided in a, lot, in a lot of tasks. And for example, connecting to the source cloud, uh, creating volumes on the target cloud, um, extracting data, importing data, and so on. Okay, you will see it pretty soon. And every task has events which detail information about what's happening. No? And, and those events are, um, are containing updates which are sent back to the conductor and the conductor stores them in a database. So anytime you can go and fetch the status of your, of your migration and, and you can display it in your user interface, whether it's a command line, uh, the web API or whatever, okay? So basically the, ma the main goal here is that you start the migration, you go out, you get a coffee, you come back and the migration is done, okay? So Coriolis is supposed to do everything with you. I usually put a joke here that the coffee has to be very, very long, okay? I'm originally Italian, so that's a total blasphemy because <laughs> uh, everything longer than an espresso doesn't work, so you might have something else to do, but anyway, you don't have to babysit your damn migration. You can do something else, come back, and the migration is done. And most important, you can also start a gazillion of those migrations at the same time and simply take a look at each one um, and, and see the status. 
Some examples here in the slides that I'm not going through because I'm going to do a full migration now, okay? What's next? Supported guest operating systems today, uh, Debian, uh, Ubuntu, so basically every ra rationally uh, feasible version of the various operating system, uh, SUSE, RHEL, CentOS, Oracle Linux, uh, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Windows uh, clients, all the supported ones, uh, Windows servers, all the supported ones, including Nano Server, okay? Um, we are also supporting, to some extent, XP in 2003. As you know, they are not supported by Microsoft, but sometimes customers still want to, to move them around. There is a REST API, so it's, it's, it's a fully public, so it's, it's also possible to, to play with it with Postman, for example, if you want to develop around it. There is a command line interface that I'm going to show you pretty soon. And there is also a, a graphical user interface in the work, okay? This is fully, uh, it's a single page application written React OS, open source, and so on, okay? Now, um, we didn't talk about the elephant in the room, which is the downtime. If I want to migrate all those virtu virtual workloads, I might not be able to do it properly if uh, if I need to shut down my source virtual machines, export the data, convert it, and start it on the target, okay? So how do we handle the downtime? We introduced a, a disaster recovery as a service feature um, that we call Replica. If the cloud allows you, for example, VMware does, OpenStack does it, and so on, um, data is backed up incrementally while your machines are fully working. How does that work? Coriolis will use the backup APIs that the platform is offering, will connect to it, and take a snapshot, let the machine running, and simply extract the data under the seed, okay? Um, migration is performed as the last final step. So you might decide for consistency to shut down your, your machine at the last step, so once you already have all the data on the target, start the one on the target, so you have just a minimum amount of downtime in the meantime, okay? Or you might just leave your machine up and running on the source and never finalize the migration and do it only if there is a disaster that, will, that won't allow you basically to run the machine on the source, no? That's why it's called disaster recovery as a service in this case, no? Um, the good thing with replicas is that since the data is fully replicated on the target, you don't need the source machine anymore, okay? So it doesn't really matter what happened to it. Um, examples of backup technologies, Cinder backup, VMware change block tracking, Windows VSS, and so on, okay? Another good thing about change block tracking and VSS is that they allow app consistency. They do what in VMware terms is called caching the file system during a snapshot. Um, if the guest operating system allows it, and what's happening is basically that um, VMware is talking to the guest operating system via uh, VMware tools, and the VMware tools are instructing the operating system to basically stop any operations that would require writes on disks. For example, on Windows, VSS will talk uh, to SQL Server, to Oracle, and applications which are enabled to do that, and those applications will stop writing data on, on the data files and only on the logs of the database. This means that if I take a snapshot and I copy it over on the target and I start, my, machine, my, my application will be in a fully consistent state. I won't get to a point in which I have a transaction which has been half written to disk just because in that specific millisecond I did my my migration, right? Uh, on Linux, it works in a similar way with file system freeze, okay? Okay, I think it's time for a demo. I have five minutes to go. Okay, let's see how to do it. So the first thing is this. Coriolis endpoint list. Let me get it a bit bigger. 
Those are, for example, three endpoints that I have uh, in, my, in my demo environment right now. One is OpenStack, one is VMware, and the other one is Oracle VM from, from another demo before, okay? All of them have an ID. So if I do a Coriolis endpoint show, and I go and take a look at it, you will see some information like a description, a name, an ID, and everything. And you can see that the connection info, I don't see any credential in clear text. It's just pointing to a Barbican secret. So what I can do is, for example, go do a Barbican secret get. And as you can see here, I can see my actual credentials. No? of a demo environment, of course. <laughs> um, and, and the same I will see for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the VMware one. For example, here you can see that it's just a JSON object which contains uh, my uh, uh, keystone version, username, password, project name, username, the usual thing that you will expect. No? I can do the same thing for a, uh, for a, for a VMware one. Here, as you can see, I have a different secret, of course. And in this case, uh, you can see there is, a, again, another test environment with, with other credentials and everything, okay? Now, um, what can we do? Um, Coriolis. I will start directly with a, with a replica. Since we don't have the time to do a full, of course, a replica, uh, to, to copy, let's say, an entire machine from one to the other, we will do an incremental replica starting from an existing one, okay? So uh, Coriolis replica list, as I was saying. So you here I have a bunch of them. For example, let's take this Ubuntu one here, okay? Coriolis replica show. And this is showing me some details, telling me, uh, for example, that I have um, um, a origin endpoint ID and a destination endpoint ID, okay? And then it's showing me uh, how many time I executed this replica, meaning how many time I replicated the data from source to target, okay? Now, let's go to our uh, VMware one. And uh, here is my Ubuntu VM. Okay, obviously my session expired. Let's get the console. And just write something into, into this, right? Like, like hello OpenStack. I'm just doing this just that you can see that, that there has been a, ch a change, no? Okay, good. The machine is running. I'm not touching it, okay? Uh, now, this is the ID of my replica. And I'm going to do Coriolis, execute Coriolis replica, execute, and pass the ID. Okay, it started. Now, in order to, to show you all the content, let's say, in, uh, in, in, in the, same, uh, the same screen, I will have to reduce a little bit the space. I 
I have an execution ID, which is here. And I'm going to do Coriolis replica execution show. With a watch in front, OK? So what's happening here? Um, it's a bit small, the text, but I can, I can tell you what's going on there. I have all the individual tasks. Each one has different status. For example, here I have one that gets, is called get instance info, fetching information from VMware. One which is called the deploy replica disks, creating volumes on the target OpenStack. Uh, another one which is called the deploy replica source resources, which creates some temporary virtual machines which are doing all the work. Uh, deploy replica target resources, which are deploying them on the target. And here you can see a lot of status updates. For example, here uh, it tells me that it creates a, um, a temporary keeper, um, a temporary port, floating IP, spawning a VM, and then it waits for connectivity on the SSH port there. Okay, so we create also a temporary uh, security group and everything. Once we are done with that, we move to the next step. Let's see if resolution allows. which I believe is the most interesting one, which is here at the bottom, which creates a snapshot on the source, and uh, using the CBT API gets the latest um, um, change tracking ID and tells to VMware, give me only the changes from the last time that I executed this thing, okay? So now, if you look, I, we, ch we have only three, three megabyte change, okay? out of, uh, I don't know, five gigs in total, okay? So, and, um, so that's really fast. What's happening is basically we, we take that, that data, we compress it, we send it over to an SSH channel to this temporary virtual machine running in OpenStack, and, and with information about what offset and what disk needs to be written, okay? That temporary machine has all the volumes attached from that specific machine, and simply writes that data in place, okay? At the end of the process, we will have a byte-by-byte -byte identical image between the source and the target, okay? When the replica is done, it will be marked as completed, okay? As you can see, we are already done. What's next? Well, you can repeat this process forever, and you will just have a backup copy on your, on your target machine, okay? So this part of the disaster recovery. Not only you have a copy of your data, you have also all the information needed to recreate the machine, like how many uh, CPUs are needed, you know, how much memory and stuff like that. So at some point, you might want to uh, migrate this replica. So you do Coriolis uh, migration. Deploy replica and you pass in the ID of the replica. Okay. And this will start the migration process itself. Um, Coriolis migration show. And with this we close it also. I can take a look at it. So even in this case, we are spawning a temporary machine, very small Linux machine, which will simply, okay, get up, we're waiting for connectivity, and then it will start looking for what type of operating system is actually running inside there, okay? Should be just a matter of seconds until it will start. And the next step will consist in uh, um, controlling the operating system and performing all the steps that we were mentioning before, like uh, um, rebuilding init RDs, injecting cloud init, and so on, okay? When that is done, it will simply shut down and start a new, uh, a new machine, which is actually a fully migrated machine. That's the main, the main idea. Let's see if the demo gods are kind with us. I'm sorry? 
Correct, yeah. So at this point, we are totally, so the, the VMware node can catch fire in this moment, okay? We don't care about it anymore. Yeah, the keeper uh, from the temporary machine, huh? Yeah. yeah, it's totally different. It's created on the fly. Yeah. Yeah, correct. But physically, I mean, the, it's, it, it's a different instance, right? Mm, yeah. Okay, discovering and mounting uh, um, um, the OS partitions. We can see, by the way, what's going on here. As you can see, I have a temporary machine running with a floating IP and everything, okay? So you can see here, it discovered that it's an Ubuntu 14.04, so also based on the version, you might have different actions. And it will start installing the, uh, it removed the, the OpenVM tools, and it will start now doing additional things. Okay, adding packages, it discovered that it needs to add cloud in it. All this is performed basically by CH routing into, in, into the partition, and basically act as the, part, uh, as the operating system itself. Note that we don't need any agent running on the source machine, okay? That's very important. We're pretty much towards the end. So at this point, even this part terminated, also called OS morphing. So we switch directly to finalize replica instance deployment. What's happening when a task finishes, the worker reports back to conductor, and conductor says, okay, start the next process, no? So it will simply elect a feasible worker that will perform the activity. I think we're pretty much done. Let me see. Still running, but we're at the end. Creating migrated instance. So this is the final machine that is actually going to, to be running and containing uh, the, the context that we were looking for. OK, completed. I think we are at the last step, which consists in deleting the, ter the temporary resources. Well, actually, I can remove the watch, so I can also increase the size of the font. Yeah, completed as well, which means that also my migration is completed. Now, if I go here, I refresh my instances, my temporary VM is gone, and voila, I have a thing which is called Ubuntu 14.04, which is obviously the same name of the VM on the, on the source. No? And if I click on it, I go to the console. Well, to begin with, you can see there is a cloud in it running. No? And voila. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Same things works, of course, with Windows and everything. Okay. We are slightly over time, so I have to, to close it. I don't want to keep you here from going to the party. Actually, I hope to see you at the party. But while, uh, um, while I wrap up, I'm more than happy to, to answer any question if you have it. After the, no, that's an excellent question. The replica is still there and can still running because the migration can be done in two ways. One, one is that we create a Cinder snapshot and we create a new volume out of the snapshot so we don't touch the original one. So you can basically create a test migrations just to verify that everything works. And only at the last moment, you, you can decide, okay, I want to shut down the source VM and, and finalize and delete the replica. There is a parameter for that. Ah, of course, my, my source machine is still running. I didn't, I didn't bother with that. Any other question? Yep. Excellent question. What about the networking on the VM? So here depends really on the target and source cloud. So VMware has really not much information about networks. No? So what we do is basically we create a mapping between the source and the target 
that I can see here. Let me see, yeah. So we pass a, a map which tells that, for example, network, uh, VM network local on the source cloud has to be mapped on a network called public on the other. And another one called VM network has to be mapped on a network called private on, on OpenStack, okay? So basically the deployer decides what VMware networks have to be mapped on what OpenStack networks, okay? OpenStack to OpenStack much easier because we can read the full network definition and recreate it identical on the target. Yeah, correct, yeah. That, that's the main idea. If you have even static networkings and you have private networks, you will end up with the same identical definitions, okay? What most probably will change are your public IP endpoints because you're going you know, from, uh, from between two different clouds. It, um, unless you're migrating to the same identical one, you can even migrate between, on, on the same cloud between two different tenants, okay? But that's just uh, <laughs> the exception if you want. Yeah, you can do that as well. Um, uh, not necessarily because, uh, so if you have VMware as a source, for example, since it uses the CBT APIs, it will extract the content out of the disks. So it doesn't matter really where the disks are residing. So, okay. Sorry? Domains uh, uh, from, uh, from an OpenStack to OpenStack perspective, you mean? Well, or, or Windows domains? Uh, tenants at the moment we expect to have them recreated because the idea is that you have a tenant and you move all the data from that tenant into another tenant, no? So it, it can be automated as well. We never had it as a request, but uh, we could theoretically even map tenant to ten recreate all the tenants as well as part of the process. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So the, the big bulk of it, the core of it, it's all open source. We keep just a small amount of things as closed, but um, our goal is to open source everything at some point. So the, 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 say the big part of it is open source. The open stack part is open source. Yes. Well, the, Microsoft, so the, the core, as I was saying, including the migration is open source. Um, the providers, some of them we keep them closed source and some with the open source, okay? Our final goal is to open source everything. That's our, our primary thing. Okay. You're welcome. Well, uh, yeah. Are you able to retain IP addressing too? Or do you have to? Yeah, I will tell you more. We retain even MAC addresses. MAC addresses? Yeah. IP yeah. Yeah, the idea of the MAC address is because it simplifies a lot than the recreation of the, uh, of the, so when the machine starts, it finds the same identical MAC. Okay. So we don't even have to bother in, the, yeah, yeah. We can do it also if you cannot retain the MAC addresses, but in that case it becomes difficult if you have more than one network adapter. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you guys.